is, you know. It's true. If there's anyone who's perfect, it's Tim well, Gunn, definitely. Thank you, though. I can't see all of you, but hi. So, Tim, I want to know what you wear when you're not working. It depends upon what I'm doing and where I'm going. I mean, I have to tell you, work consumes me, and I'm not complaining, I'm just describing. Um, but I haven't had a weekend off in countless months. I'm constantly doing something. Does everybody know, I mean, in addition to Project Runway and Guide to Style, which are actually very neatly contained, we tape Project Runway in 31, 32 days, and Guide to Style is a weekend episode, and there are eight of them. But then I'm Chief Creative Officer of Liz Claiborne, so I have a full plate. So I can't say to Liz Claiborne, um, I'm going to go to the beach for a couple of days right. because they don't see a lot of me. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I'm when I am home on a Saturday and I go out to get coffee in the paper and go grocery shopping and do my laundry and pick up my dry cleaning, I wear jeans and a t-shirt and a jacket. I love it. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to see and that. To throw the jacket. Would out. you ever call yourself a glamour don't? Like, what's your down outfit? Probably just that. Okay. I, <laughs> I clean it. my apartment in a pair of shorts. I mean, not, I mean, short shorts, not underwear shorts. <laughs> I'd love to see, um, tell me a little bit about a typical day. A typical, well, How do you balance all three things? All right, let me describe today. Okay. Um, I had, um, God, I'm trying to think back. It seems like such a long day. Well, it is a long day. <laughs> all right, let me describe today. Um, I have, I just returned from New Orleans where we had a Liz Claiborne holiday fashion show at a newly reopened, not, no, it's a brand new Macy's, Macy's Lakeside. Um, so I flew back from that, uh, let me give you the last couple of days, flew back from that um, last uh, Saturday night, um, didn't get in until close to one o'clock in the morning, had to change planes in Detroit and they lost my luggage. So they no longer, I'm, I'm like Rick Van Winkle, I've been asleep for 40 years. I thought that the airline would send your luggage to your apartment, mm -hmm. no. So I, in the middle of the marathon, I had to go pick it up yesterday oh. because I needed stuff that was in it for today. So that derailed some of yesterday. I had to have a lunch with an auction winner um, and her husband, which was perfectly delightful. And I actually had the evening sort of free, which was nice. Um, then I had an eight o'clock morning uh, meeting at Liz Claiborne. Then I had a meeting with my boss at 11 to make a presentation about the rest of the, um, well, the rest of the winter season and then projecting into the, the spring and summer season in terms of the various brands. Um, then I met with the head of marketing at Liz and I had a whole series of Liz Claiborne meetings. Then I had to go replace my cell phone at Sprint. <laughs> <laughs> then I came running back to my apartment to actually change because I looked, at, well, I'll tell you the, the honest truth. Somebody spilled, somebody on the 42nd Street um, was all in a lather and fervor about the fact that I was sitting there in front of her and she, and her Starbucks coffee went up in the air and came all over me. So I couldn't have come here like that. I looked very badly stained and it wasn't okay. good. Um, I just want to make certain I'm talking to everybody. Um, and then I came here to, right. to, to be with you, and I'm thrilled. And then I have to run home because I have, a, I have, have what we call a radio roundup of interviews that are happening in Australia. So because, so because of the time change, I'm doing it, well, I'm doing them in, at night. It's their morning. Um, so whenever that ends, I'll have a frozen pizza. <laughs> so. so about Project One Way, yeah. have you ever disagreed with what the judges. I disagree with the judges all the time. <laughs> all the time. And, and if you ever see season six, which we just wrapped, and I say that only because with this lawsuit, you know, we don't know what's going to happen to it. I, I, those crack smoking judges is all I have to say. <laughs> no, I disagree all the time. You do. I, 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 I tend to agree, well, I tend to agree more with what goes home than with what wins. Um, and I will say that when the work is well executed, and generally speaking it is, it does become a matter of taste. But I often think that the judges aren't really fully considering, to the extent that the, I believe they should, the context of the challenge. Right. Meaning, what was the problem that they were solving? Right. Um, because it may be a beautifully executed dress, but does it really correspond to the demands of the challenge? What has been your highlight of all of the Project Runways. If you're gonna think about that one moment that was the most interesting to you, 
what would you say that it was? Well, can I really tell you what it is? Yes, because really. It wasn't they actually, wanted to know the secrets, it wasn't, right? Well, it, it, it's can actually rather independent of taping the show. We had tape season one, and I have to tell you, in all honesty, I never dreamed there'd be a second season. I, I thought this show has been a tremendous amount of fun to do, and doing it will be good cocktail party talk. And I just never dreamed we'd have a season two. And, and, and I also want everyone to know, my first involvement with Project Runway has had nothing to do with what I do on the show now. I was, I was a consultant. And my role on the show was in absolutely no one's vocabulary. Um, so e even that happening was a huge surprise for me. And I have to add, no one ever said this to me, but I'm, I'm still confident that the producers created this role because they were fearful that by giving the designers a challenge and sending them into the workroom, no one would speak. They do their work, and you wouldn't hear a voice again until they come onto the runway to present their design. So by sending me in to probe and to query, it would at least elicit some dialogue. And on that note, I was equally confident that I wouldn't be in the show. As long as they have the designers responding to me, you don't need to see me, you don't need to hear my voice. So, when we had the premiere, I didn't attend because I thought, if I'm in the show, what am I going to look like and sound like and be like? And if I'm not in the show, I'm going to be totally humiliated. So, we, the, the show aired and I was very concerned about how 7th Avenue would respond, how our industry would respond to all of this. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very mixed. And some people I, I was and still am very close to were very naysaying about it. They thought it was unrealistic in terms of, of time constraints. Um, I dis d disagreed then, I still disagree. Um, they felt that it didn't portray the industry the way that they would like to, and I'll give you my interpretation of that. Prior to, pr to, prior to Project Runway, the industry was really portrayed in a very glamorous way. It was like this big, frothy confection. And furthermore, it was, the, the confection was a kind of veil of mystery over all of it, and it caused everyone to think, including my students, that, oh, this, while I'm a student, it's hard work, but once I get into the industry as a designer, or as a merchant, or a stylist, whatever the role, role may be, it's gonna be nothing but um, glamor, and um, I'll be, at the end of a runway, collecting a huge bouquet of flowers, and I'll be flying off to Saint-Tropez to rest and repair, and it's like, like <laughs> baloney. So Project Runway rips the veil off and says, look, this industry is dirty, gritty, daunting, difficult, and unless you love it, don't do it. So the industry was a little snarky about it. So here's the moment I was, I'm leading up to. Okay. It's Bastille Day. 2005, we have just wrapped season two of Project Runway. So we've had it, we, we, season one has aired, season two has been done. And the, I, I get choked up about this. The Emmys are announced. For, and Project Runway, season one has been nominated for an Emmy. So the producers are, and, and the crew are still at Parsons because we just wrapped. And I go tearing through the halls of Parsons, shouting at the top of my lungs, we're nominated for an Emmy! We're nominated for an Emmy! And then that evening, walking home, I was on 7th Avenue and, and just fairly coincidentally ran into two of the people who were snarky. And I just looked at them and I knew I had, uh, forgive me, kind of shit-eating grin on my face. <laughs> and I just said, well, for all of your bad-mouthing at Project Runway, we've just been nominated for an Emmy. <laughs> and it was, uh, it, that was a thrilling, thrilling moment because it was, it was a, an endorsement that it's a show of quality, and we were the first cable show ever to be nominated in that category, ever. Um, and we've had <laughs> three subsequent seasons of Emmy nominations. We never won, but we did win a Peabody Award this past year. And do you all know the Peabody? Yeah. So there we were. You can't nominate yourself. The, the committee has to find you and select you, the Peabody Committee. So there we were with news programs and documentaries, and there's strife and consternation everywhere, and blood and death and destruction, and then there's happy, peppy little us. <laughs> so it was really, it was really thrilling. It was really, really thrilling. That's amazing. I told you I would babble away. No, I love it. I think it's <laughs> phenomenal. Um, is there any scene that was cut from Project Runway that you wish would have aired? Oh, lots of them. Give me I like mean, a highlight behind the scenes, juicy bit of information that all of us would love to hear about. Well, the brilliance of the show is 
how deft the editors are because there are dozens and dozens of hours of tape from anywhere from four to six or, well, eight, nine cameras. And I see everything, um, except what happens in the apartments, and I don't want to see it. Um, <laughs> I see everything that's happening in the workroom all day, and I, I don't know how I, I would ever tell the story in terms of, of being able to slice and dice it and, and be cohesive. Um, and it's especially true when we have seasons where we're still taping when the show begins to air because the, the editors and the producers don't know what the outcome of the show is. Right. And so part of their goal is to give you a little bit more of who will be staying in longer. And if you don't know, it can, it can be really difficult. So what, God, there's so much Well, that's maybe what I was out. trying to think about is, have you ever had a conflict with Michael or Nina or Heidi? Oh, but you have Heidi to remember, Susie, I don't, I don't engage with Michael or, or, or Heidi right. or, or Nina um, when we're taping. I mean. That's not true. I say hello, but that's it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a church and state situation for me, really, because they want to talk to me about what's been going on in the workroom. What do I think? What happened? Who, who struggled? Who was falling apart? Who do I think should really win? Who should go home? I can't do that. So I, I, I am there during the judgings, but I'm in the, the very back of the auditorium, both literally and metaphorically, in the dark. Um, and. Do I want to sh jump up and shout and say things? All the time, all the time. But I, let, me, let me give you one behind the scenes thing okay. that I wish had been on the show because it, it highlighted his insanity. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many of you saw season three. We went to Paris. Vincent Libretti. Yeah. <laughs> Vincent is or was, had been a vegan and we were very, very respectful of that. And, and, and uh, responded to, to, all, to anyone's dietary needs, but he was particularly vocal about them. And anticipating going to Paris is all he talked about. They'll ever understand this, they won't be able to accommodate this, what are we gonna do, what am I gonna do, I'll, I'll starve. Trust me, Vincent, you won't starve. So in the show, I take the designers to a restaurant the first night that we're there. This is all real, we really did this. And we called ahead and made, and to explain Vincent's needs. And they couldn't have been lovelier and more accommodating. And they had a three-course meal for him, and everything was set up. So we arrive at the restaurant, and this is all on camera. I tell him that this is th the situation, and that they couldn't have been nicer, and to relax, not to worry about it. And he said, I don't want their vegan meal. What do you mean you don't want it? What are you going to eat? So he picks up the chalkboard that was next to the table. He says, I'm going to have the leg of lamb. <laughs> the leg of lamb? <laughs> What are you talking about, the leg of lamb? And he looks at me and says, when in Rome. <laughs> so I wish it had been in the show. That and the other thing that wasn't in the show, that by I me mean, a lot of editing, was this was season five's Kenley. Because if you saw as much of her and heard as much of her as I did, you would have turned the TV off. <laughs> really. She's very talented, but annoying. She has cornered the market. Well, and, and insulting and disrespectful, but. So let's talk Tim Gunn Guide to Style. Okay. We're gonna switch hats here. <laughs> What's it like when someone resists the makeover? I mean, what do you do? How do you react? Has there been an experience that you've had that yes. you thought was well, really frustrating for you? And how did you handle it? Are any of you watching Guide to Style? Yes. A few of you? Good. Thank you. Keep watching. <laughs> we, we need the ratings. Um, well, it, the show is not an intervention, for those of you who haven't seen it. It's not an intervention. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in taking someone who friends or family have sort of turned in and say, okay, we're going to rescue you from your fashion foibles. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't want to be rescued. Right. They could be perfectly happy the way that they are, and that's fine. Just own responsibility for how you're presenting yourself to the world. So it's not an intervention. <laughs> but I will say, this journey that we take is very difficult, and it's difficult, and you know this as well as I do, because mm -hmm. when you tap into somebody's fashion core, you're tapping into their psyche. You're tapping into a very personal place, and it's highly sensitive. So for most of the women we work with, th it gets to a point where they don't feel comfortable going any, any further than we've taken them. And part of it is also the speed with which we do it. I mean, if we tape the show in six days, um, and 
I'll be, I want me to give full disclosure to these things, I'm transparent. <laughs> One day is off camera. One day is an off camera shopping day after we first go shopping because we've got to get it right and believe me, we don't have enough time when we're taping. Mm -hmm. So, but I say it's not a lot of time. For us in terms of production, it's absolutely adequate time. But for them in terms of recalibrating their thinking about themselves, it's an adjustment that they're going through. And they reach a sticking point that's very difficult to go beyond, and they tend to retreat back to where they were. In season one, we were working with a teacher from New Jersey who only wore um, cargo capri pants, if you can believe that, cargo capris, <laughs> and tank tops. And that was her whole dressing vocabulary, and including at school. I thought, oh my god, those kids, no wonder the world's dressed the way they are. <laughs> so. She really pushed back when we were shopping. And it was a matter, because um, this was Veronica Webb I was working with last season. Veronica and I s said with impunity, we're not doing this for you. You need to do the decision making here. I don't know what to do, but I don't know what to do. And then it results in a cascade of tears and a, I'm just gonna leave, I'm gonna go. To which we disarm everyone when we say, if you wanna go, you're perfectly free to. You can, you can go right back, you can do it. Um, we don't have to continue this journey. And then they're really surprised because I think they think that they're our hostage. <laughs> and um, we're going to say, no, now we're going to put the handcuffs on you. Um, but no, we're, we're very supportive of that. If that's really what they need to do, if this is so difficult and they can't do it, fine. So that's one example. Anyone watching this season? Allie? The woman from the Upper East Side married to the plastic surgeon? <laughs> I'm going to give you, again, full disclosure of the situation so you know that we don't make this stuff up. First of all, what we represented at her as her home was not, and I'll tell you why. She told us that her snooty co-op wouldn't allow a film crew in. That may be true, or it, it, it was plausible. We found out later she made it up. It was a manipulation, and this is what the manipulation was about. We send our crew over to take everything that's in her closets, closets writ large, wherever they are in the apartment, and bring all of it over to the space that we rented for a day. And then, so when we go to her closet, they really are her things. It's not really her apartment, and she was very upset that it wasn't up to her standards, even though it was this stunning apartment in Tribeca overlooking the river. I thought, anyway, I won't, don't get me started about it. I'm getting myself started. <laughs> so, because I get angry every time I think about this. So, I ask her to go into the closet and find 10 items that she can't live without. And she says, very matter-of-factly, there aren't 10 items in there that I can't live without. What are you talking about? Well, this is your closet, and you're the fashion maven, and you're the one who just put on this preposterous special event outfit where she looked like she was dating the Tin Woodman. <laughs> um, ridiculous. And she was passionate about that. So what do you mean? She said, well, I only bought, th brought, and, uh, and this is the quote, my crappy stuff. What are you talking about? Well, aren't you going to throw everything away? No. What do you mean? Well, the good closet is in a different wing, wing of the apartment. How do you like that as a phrase? I wish I could throw that wing. out. Yeah, and the other wing. Um, an apartment which, of course, we never saw. Mm -hmm. So I just said, stop. I went to the producers. Of course, they're there. They're in the background. I said, now what are we going to do? And we had a, a, a caucus, a little um, conversation, because were we going to actually send a van over and get all the other clothes? and decided she made this bed, she can lie on it. So we went back to her and said, no, we're dealing, you've dealt this hand, not only have you dealt it to us, we're gonna play it and you're gonna have to play it. So whatever direction this takes, do mm -hmm. it. So find 10 items you can't live without. So now fast forward to shopping Neiman Marcus. Neiman Marcus, um, she, is on the first floor of, this is out of Shore Hills Mall. First floor with Greta, hates everything. Hates absolutely everything. Nothing meets her standards, <laughs> nothing at all. Greta says, all right, we're going up to the second floor, which is the designer floor. that has the $11,000 Valentinos, if you're lucky to find one on sale. <laughs> and we have a shopping budget of $4,000. We don't talk about budget on the show, but that's the shopping budget. Um, so she's suddenly rhapsodic. She's in ecstasy, and she's pulling things, and 
fur coats. I mean, <laughs> it's insanity. So it's like, you have to put this back. This isn't going to work for us. We have to work within this budget. To which she maligns me, the show, the budget, how unrealistic it is. No one could go through life and have a shopping trip and only spend $4,000. It's like, <laughs> all right, listen, sister. <laughs> I've had it. I've really had it at this point. So. And did you let that out? Did I let did indeed out? let it out, all on camera. And it was very artfully edited because mm -hmm. it, it went on and on and on, including her saying, well, if, if we had my real closet, the Valentino would be, would be on the, um, I can't even remember the term we use anymore, um, on, on the keeper rack. But the Valentino isn't here and we don't have it. So this is the hand we've been dealt. You have to deal with this. So at any rate, I did cause her to completely crumble, burst into tears, go running into the dressing room, at which point the entire crew gave me a round of applause. Because <laughs> everybody had had it with her. Am I answering your question? That's absolutely the answer. <laughs> okay. Bingo. Um, what happened to Veronica Webb? Where'd she go? Veronica is fabulous and I adore her and I will say I believe things happen for a reason. Veronica could not return for season two owing to a BBC commitment for a style show and the timing of when we were airing our show. And she has two little girls who live with her, Veronica and, and her husband in Key West. So doing season one was a strain for her and she put up some parameters for season two that we just couldn't accommodate. And I, I adore Greta Monaghan. I'm sh thrilled that she's with us. And I will say, upon reflection, and I say this in the context and capacity of adoring, adoring, adoring Veronica, I th I, I, reflecting upon season one, I thought, well, if you were fashion challenged, and it's one thing to have me appear at your door, it's another thing to have a six foot one supermodel appear right. at your door, too, <laughs> to peer down upon you right. and say, well, guess what? All these rules that Tim Gunn is dishing out, I can break all of them. And, it, and Veronica t could. Right. So it, 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 but it was, yeah, I mean, I miss her, but things do happen for a reason. If you were going to give advice to anyone who was starting off as a designer, what advice would you give them? Oh, how much time do we have? You've got <laughs> three minutes. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, I'd ask them if they're absolutely certain about who they are as a designer, about their point of view. I mean, I, I take certain things for granted about designers. Um, who are launching or who are about to, who are sort of incubating, that they're talented, that they have the aptitude for it, and that they have a kind of passion. I, I don't know how extensive, but what's really important is for them to understand, any, anyone in this industry, no matter what capacity they're working in, but it's especially true for designers, it's a huge collaboration. It is enormous. And they're only one part, aspect of the collaboration. Um, even when the label has their name on it, there are so many moving parts that come into play. And for the designer, the designer has to think beyond the runway show. Maybe that's not a desire, but let's say that it is. Mm -hmm. They have to think beyond that to, okay, you have the runway show. Then what happens? Then what happens? Well, then I guess I, I read the reviews, and if the reviews are good, I have another show? No. You'd like to think that the reviews are good, but the buyers are going to come back to your showroom. Do you, have you thought about that? Have you thought about a showroom? Have you thought about the translation of the work from the runway to the showroom? Are you ready for production? Do, have, you, have you sourced fabrics and buttons and zippers? Uh, do you have a, um, a, a rep at um, customs? I mean, I'm giving you the most minute part of this. Um, but there's so many aspects to this. But I will also add, it depends upon what scale you want. And, this, and I'll go back to Project Runway for this. Uli from season three from Florida. Every, there was a fervor for her designs after the show aired. And she and I still speak about every four months. Um, and it's always the same conversation. I always have the same, she always asks the same questions and I have the same answers. The, her questions are, what am I going to do? There's so many people who want my work and now Bloomingdale's wants it, and so-and-so wants it, but I, I can't deliver because I do all the production. Uli, I know you do all the production. If you want a client like Bloomingdale's, you have to let go. You have to, you have to be working with tech packs and with, with huge quantities of, of, of fabric, 
and you have to have production happen elsewhere. You can still go and oversee it occasionally, but you've got to let go of it, to which she says, I can't do that. Then stop taking Bloomingdale's calls. So it really depends upon how ambitious a designer wants to be and what kind of market they want to be in. I, I want to say this, though, too. If your goal to be in this industry, if anyone here is thinking about being a fashion designer or is one, if your goal is to make money, you have to have scale. You just have to. Um, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about getting rich, I'm just talking about surviving beyond a cold water walk up flat, which is sort of what I live in, <laughs> or used to. Um, it's really about having enough scale to be able to achieve it. And, and, and again, in the spirit of full disclosure, you may have read that uh, Narcisa Rodriguez is no part of the Liz Claiborne Inc. group. He's not. And there's a reason for it. I mean, we are a publicly held company. We're going through a tremendous transition. We were downsizing brands. Narcisa was not meant to be one of them. But his brand was losing $12 million a year. And we, were, we reached a point, and this is Narcisa Rodriguez. This is a famous brand. This is someone with a big show every season during New York Fashion Week. Um, we just could not sustain that level of giving an allowance and saying, OK, do your creative thing. Right. We had profuse discussions with Narciso about a diffusion line, um, about accessories, about ways to, aspects of, of, of being a brand and actually making money. And there was resistance. So we just said we can't, we can't keep losing $12 million every year in order to do this. And we felt bad about it. It doesn't diminish his talent in any way. But this is what I mean about it's, unless you have scale, you really can't make money. Anyway, shut up, Tim. No, I think that's good. Thank you so much. That's good, no. Um, what are your top five fashion pet peeves that you see on the street daily? I'm looking around. <laughs> so I don't offend anyone. <laughs> Crocs. <laughs> Bear midriffs. So anyone at any age. <laughs> And I'm not talking about the unintentional thing that can happen. I'm talking about the intentional. Um, poor fit. I find that with most people, their clothes are simply too big for them. And it's the comfort trap, in my view. Um, and people tend to feel, and if people are not um, resigned to their shape, if they think that they're not as, as small as they'd like to be, they tend to think that if they have clothes that have a little more volume, it will disguise that, but in fact, the more volume your clothes has, have, the, the more volume it looks like you have. Right. Um, Fact. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's another aspect, just generally speaking. Um, Flip-flops in the in inappropriate places. I don't believe they belong in Midtown. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is, a, this is a major world capital. Um, what, what, what are they doing at Rockefeller Center? <laughs> um, and the sweatsuit out of a gym, unless you're traveling from your home to the gym, that's a whole other matter. But um, it, it, I, I've seen my book in the front row. Thank you. There's a, <laughs> there's a mention in the book about being at um, the theater with Grace Mirabella, uh, former editor in chief of Vogue, um, who's a dear, dear, dear friend. And here we are, we're in hugely expensive orchestra seats. And this couple comes by us wearing not just a sweat sweatsuit, matching sweatsuits. <laughs> and I thought, how can this be? Do they plan on napping during intermission? <laughs> how can this be? So I just, I just believe in dressing appropriately. What without are, being too stuffy in spite of how I look. What are three things that people find surprising about you that they don't know that then they find out and they're surprised by? Well, I think, I mean, pe people who know me from television, I guess the, that's the way most people do know me, they make a certain assumption about me that I'm very approachable and very accessible, and I think they're a little disarmed when they learn that that's true, that I really am. <laughs> um, and and I, I mean, I love having people come up to me, and I love hearing that they love the show, and, and I mean, I have to tell you, everyone, when this happens to you after you turn 50, as it happened to me, you really appreciate it. I mean, you realize it's totally surreal. It's totally, what? That's Kay. Speaking of Guide to Style, Kay Unger, everybody. Kay, stand up. 
big fashion designer. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, they, uh, at, at any rate, when this happens to you after you turn 50, you have a way of bracketing it that allows you to say to yourself, I am the luckiest guy in the world. This is completely and totally bizarre and surreal. And to be at an airport and have a bunch of high school girls come up to you <laughs> and, and just sort of be stammering and in awe, and then to have someone my age come up to me in the same airport, look at me and ask, who are you? <laughs> Thinking, what are those young girls doing over here with that old man? So it's, it's, um, that's, that's one thing. People aren't expecting me to be as accessible as I am. Um, I mean, something that people learn about me, and, and, and this was true when I was teaching, and it's something my students knew about me, I, I really care. I mean, I really, I really care, and I really want to help, and I really want people to ascend to as high a level as they can, and I really want to know how I can channel who you are, so you need to tell me about you. Um, and what you're trying to achieve, and will help make you be the best of, of that. And you know, for all of you, I'm not a fashion designer. I, I, I never have pretended to be. And I believe that the work I achieved at Parsons, and as chair of the Department of Fashion Design, was precisely because I'm not a fashion designer. I don't have a particular point of view that I feel I own, and therefore everyone should be a mini-me. I don't have um, an, an ax to grind about anything other than quality, taste, and style. That, that I do want to uphold. Mm -hmm. But whatever, it, whatever you are, whether you're Kay Unger, whether you're Narcisa Rodriguez, whether you're Dolce & Gabbana, um, Ashley Berrier, wh whatever you are, I'm there to support you to be the best that you can be. So people are surprised to hear that. They think, well, you're going to have a very particular point of view and I need to design a certain way. The, the Project Runway designers, when we first start launching a new season, tend to think that about me too. When I come, go around to do my first critique, they're, as I, I, I have a Socratic approach. It's all about probing them with questions. And they're, because you don't hear all that on the show, they just think, I'm going to give this one little um, clipped response and walk away. No, we spent a lot of time together. It's all edited down to to um, whatever is necessary for the show, but um, that's, they're not expecting either. You mean you really do spend all this time with us? Yes, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, <laughs> and I don't know what else. Like, do you water ski or do you do anything? What do you do when you're not on television and you're not well, helping fashion designers? I, I mean, in order to, re to, to, to relax, my greatest pleasure is walking in the city. And I, my, my um, destination, my route is the, um, God, I've had, it's been so long since I've been there, um, the, 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 the whole Hudson River Park. Um, I go from 23rd Street all the way down and around. I come up by the South Street Seaport, visit the Strand, and walk home. Um, favorite store? Favorite store? For you, where you're always successful. You can tell by the pause <laughs> that that's a challenge. Um, I'll tell you my go-to place because I can generally find something and I can wear it right off the rack. I can wear it that day, that night. For me, it's Banana Republic. And Fashion. it's affordable and their menswear just happens to fit me. Favorite perfectly. restaurant? Gotham Bar and Grill, very nearby. Favorite very, bar? Favorite bar, same place. They don't call it Gotham Bar and Grill for nothing. In fact, <laughs> I, more frequently, I more frequently go to the bar than, than dine there. In fact, I infrequently dine there. That is amazing. But I, I love the place. I assume all of you have been. Yeah, it's, a great, it's a great watering hole. Is there yeah. anyone who intimidates you in this industry? Tons of people intimidate me. Um, and let's hear who. And oh, why. my God. One. Well, almost anybody at Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a story I could really tell you, but I won't because I told it once and I got in big trouble um, <laughs> from you-know-who. Um, I mean, people, I, I spent a lot of time on the red carpet for award shows on the other side of the stanchion, meaning covering it. Not, uh, nothing's worse than walking that red carpet, which is why I have such respect for people who do. I mean, I would have to take so many tranquilizers <laughs> that I'd be sort of bobbing and weaving my way down. Um, 
I have to say there are people in, in that industry who have really, where I just end up melting into a puddle. Um, I was backstage, as I al almost always am, with the exception of season five, I was backstage at our Project Runway finale at Bryant Park, and this is season four, and it's m a mob scene back there. there. We had 60 models, we had a corresponding number of hair and makeup people, we had our dressers, we had the designers, we had a camera crew, we had a ton of people. And the show's about to start, and this woman comes whooshing by me, and she stops, she turns, she takes both my hands like this, and she says, Tim Gunn. And I looked at her, and I, I, I'm, well, I, again, I'm kind of getting emotional. Meryl Streep! <laughs> and I, was, I said, I'm in a puddle. <laughs> so she just completely caused me to melt away. And when I do the red carpet, it's usually for the Today Show, and there's a wonderful producer with whom I work who's always there to give me a heads up about who's coming, which is useful because there's so many people and you just, and you don't always know. I mean, sometimes they are dressed like a float in a parade and you think, who is that? <laughs> um, but she was distracted by something and this woman came up to me and there she was, planted in front of me. And, and it's taking me longer to tell this than what the time that it, that it took to take place, but mm -hmm. I'm thinking, who is she, who is she, who is she? She's more mature, she's stunning, but she's not a starlet by any means. And she started to speak, and I realized just a mere two syllables into it, it was Catherine Deneuve. And again, I was just, I thought, thank God I didn't have a heads up, because I would have been in the puddle before she got to me. Right. <laughs> so. Craziest question someone, stranger, has ever asked you? A stranger is usually about my sex life. <laughs> <laughs> and they never believe me when I ask, and I respond, what sex life? <laughs> so, when they think I'm just being evasive, I'm not. Is there a question that, <laughs> is there a question that some of it might ask you that makes you feel like you want to talk to them further? And one that turns you off? Um, a question that causes me to want to talk to them further versus a turn off. Well, question. when it's about them. That always makes me want to talk to them further. I, I, I mean, if it's something, if they have a need that they're demonstrating to me, I want to know more. And ideally, I, I think that they're, I mean, I assume that they're asking for some help, and I'd like to be able to help them. I mean, there are some frustrating moments, though. I had a relentless question asker. She wasn't going to let go of me until I told her where, until I, I told her where she should buy a wedding dress. Because every suggestion I came up with, oh, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. It's like, well, I don't know what to say to you anymore. You've been, you've been everywhere, you've been online, you've talked to, to designers who will custom design dresses. I don't know what to say to you. I don't know what to say. I've, I've exhausted all, everything that's, that, that I have to offer when it comes to this. The, the, thing, the turn off for me is a, someone who approaches me with a huge <coughs> dose of arrogance. Um, and know-it-allness, and they're just showing their, I mean, metaphorically speaking, their awards and their muscles and their, um, how great and fabulous and fantastic they are and who the hell do I think I am? And I'm inclined to agree with them. You're absolutely right. Who the hell am I? And I bolt. Um, <laughs> I find that that's just, you know, don't, you don't need to do that. And when I really find it's distasteful is when the other party, me, would go up against them with, well, let me tell you something. Um, because then it's like two dogs sniffing each other. It's just really, it's just really not necessary. So last question, and then I'll open it okay. up to Q&A. Where are you from, and when did you decide this is what I want to do? You wanted to be in fashion. Um, I'm from born? Washington, D.C., which, with the exception of the Kennedy administration, was, is not a very fashionable place, or never was. But there's hope, if tomorrow is correct, um, <laughs> there is hope. Um, and I, I've always been, I was always interested in design, uh, especially architecture, and I w was um, a Lego fiend as a kid and couldn't get enough of it, and in my day, centuries ago, the box of Lego didn't tell you what to do with it. They were just, blocks, and you did whatever you wanted with them, um, as opposed to today where they tell you, here, you make this. Um, and 
I grew up, I mean, took piano lessons for 12 years. That's one thing people don't generally know about me. Um, and still remember the day when I came to terms with the fact that I wasn't a prodigy. It was like, uh-oh, now what am I going to do? Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm always talking about my serendipitous path of life. I, I mean, how many people actually achieve what they set out to achieve when they're playing in a sandbox? Um, I don't know that many do. And if they do, I wonder how many opportunities they didn't consider or didn't, didn't have their radar up to to receive and, and for the possibility of consideration. Um, and I ended up flirting, well, I ended up studying architecture, I was about to say flirting with the study of architecture, which is sort of more like what it was. Um, and talk about having your bubble burst. I came to terms of wanting to really wanting to be an architect and um, couldn't get enough of architecture. In fact, my, my mother still recalls the day that uh, she and my father took my sister and me to Monticello, Jefferson's home in Charlottesville, Virginia. And I was nine. And what did I buy in the bookstore? Thomas Jefferson's architectural drawings. And that's what I bought with my allowance money. <laughs> um, I still have it. And so that when, that, went, that when that study went awry, I ended up studying English and getting a degree in it. And it was. Where? At Yale. And it was in my final year there that I met this extraordinary, well, I, I had wanted to take art classes and gave up, because, because unless you were an art and architecture major, it wasn't going to happen. So it was my final year, and they let me take a, a, an art course, a drawing course. And I met this extraordinary woman by the name of Ann Truitt, um, who will have a retrospective at the Hirshhorn Museum next fall, fall of 09. She's now deceased. And I have to say, when I was here at, Par at Parsons, at the New School, um, I advocated for her to get an honorary degree, and she did. It was in the mid-90s. Anyway, that was such an extraordinary experience for me. Um, it, was, it was probably the biggest epiphany I've ever, I had ever had in my life, because suddenly, and, and I was a very serious student, it was all that I had. I wasn't an athlete, I wasn't a joiner, I was a very introspective kid. I grew up with an absolutely horrible, debilitating stutter, another thing people don't generally expect to hear from me. Um, and it was so bad that it just caused me to be very reclusive. Um, and so I had this experience that opened up this tremendously huge world for me. And suddenly, this serious student who was always so aware that the answer was out there somewhere, it's in the back of the book somewhere, it's there. Suddenly in this world of, 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 of art, the answer was only in me. And it was a matter of how do, I, how, do I, how do I tap into it and how do I represent it? And I followed Anne Truitt to Washington where she was teaching at a museum school called the Corcoran. And I won't say I studied with her for three years. I did study with her over those three years, but I studied um, fine art, specifically sculpture. Um, well, it, be, it evolved into sculpture. I had to take a three-dimensional design course as a second semester student there, and I went to, I went as far as the dean to say, this doesn't interest me, I already have an undergraduate degree, I don't need to waste my time with this stuff. And he said to me, just do it, it's a requirement. And I went in kicking and screaming. And I came out a changed person. Suddenly I realized that this three-dimensional world was really where I, what I wanted to, to make work for. Um, so I, I, I built, I, in order to survive, I built architectural models for a lot of architects in Washington. And then the Corcoran invited me to teach, and that's a whole other, I mean, I could talk about this for hours, I won't. This is um, great. But they taught me, they invited me to teach. Um, I was very flattered, then I became the assistant to the chairman of the fine arts department. Then the director of admissions at, at, at um, the Corcoran went on maternity leave. I mean, it wasn't as though they didn't know she was going somewhere, <laughs> but they had made no arrangements to replace her. So she was already gone. And the dean of the school said to me, do you want to take over? Well, I work for Rona Slade, the chairman of fine arts. I need to talk to her about it. And Rona said, it's a good opportunity. Why don't you do it? While, but though I was still teaching. So I ended up entering this world that 
I wasn't particularly fond of, but I was loyal to the school. And I wasn't fond of it because I had to go out and make uh, presentations and go to these national portfolio days and represent the school and, and stand, in, stand up well and review portfolios all day, which wasn't that I, didn't, I minded that, except that I was at this little tiny museum school and you know, we'd have six people come to us all day. And I'd look at schools like Parsons and they'd be mobbed and they'd have 10 people there. And I'd think, well, God, I feel so inadequate, and I was. But I got to know these people, the people across the nation in art and design schools, because we traveled together. And the Parsons people called me and offered me a position. And I said, no, thank you very much. I'm happy in Washington. I'm happy at the Corcoran. I'm happy with my personal life. And I'm, I'm flattered, but no thank you. And in the course of the next 10 months, my life changed dramatically in ways that I could never, ever have anticipated. And Parsons called me again. What happened? Um, I was passed over for a promotion. Um, my personal life, uh, I won't even say eroded, it blew up, not at my doing. And, and I, I'll just say to all of you, this was, the, this was the 1982 at this point, it was the advent of AIDS. And I had a partner who not only threw me out, but when he threw me out, said he'd been sleeping with everybody he could find. Um, having to do with the fact that he didn't have enough patience for me. So you said you wanted the Barbara Walters interview. This is it. This is um, <laughs> So I was, thank God I kept my apartment is all I kept saying. Um, so I left him that night, got into my car, remember pulling off of Connecticut Avenue in Washington because I, I was, had reached a, a point of paralysis. And I was so hurt. And then about three days later, and I had to work with this person day in and day out. Three days later, I just became angry because I thought, you know, he could have, I mean, he could have given me something that will kill me. And was tested every year for 14 years, and knock wood, no, I'm fine. Um, why am I sharing all this? Oh, that my life had changed so dramatically. Right. <laughs> so Parsons called. See, I really got in a moment. I, this is great. So then Parsons <laughs> called, and they, they, they said, we'd like to talk to you about the job again. And I said, great, I'll come up. Um, and two weeks later, I was living in New York. And Parsons, for me, was, was my design education. I, I, I arrived a sculptor and a teacher of three-dimensional design. And suddenly, I had to work with uh, applicants who wanted to be architects and interior designers and fashion designers and product designers and illustrators and painters and sculptors also, um, photographers. And it was a huge, huge learning curve. And I remember my first department chair meeting and the orientation because I arrived uh, right before Labor Day, so right when the academic year was beginning. And the admissions staff, we were about to go out on the road, and we were meeting with all the, d the department chairs to get an update. And the first department chair with whom I met was Frank Rizzo, uh, chair of fashion design. And Frank was, oh, I have to tell you too, I walked into his office, and I saw the list of all these companies. Kay, you remember that list. Um, the list of all these companies, and I thought, wow, what placement this place has. Look at these companies. And I realized, those aren't the companies. Those are the names of the graduates. So it was everybody you could think of, and it continues to be. So Frank was talking about the process of what a fashion designer does. And I listened very, and I was sincerely interested and, and, and responded when he was through. Well, you know, it's just like, I mean, in many ways, it's no different than what a sculptor does. And I still remember Frank rearing back saying, you couldn't be more mistaken. It's not at all what a sculptor does. And I said, what do you mean? He said, as a sculptor, you have the luxury of setting for yourself, defining for yourself the problem that you're going to solve, whatever it may be. You have the luxury of setting your own deadlines. I mean, this is independent. I mean, unless you're having a show or something, and then you're making work for a show, which is a whole different matter, but shut up, Jim. Um, <laughs> he said, fashion designers have a, 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 an outside client. They have, they have a customer they're designing for. That customer has needs. They have to address those needs. They have to design this collection, present it, either 
runway, showroom, or both, and then turn on a dime and do it all over again. And in fact, today, design, fashion designers are, are really have their hands in, a, in three seasons simultaneously. So he said, it's not at all like w being a sculptor. And, and it was a big wake-up call for me. Um, and my work in admissions, I arrived assistant director. I was then made associate director, then director of admissions. And then we had a new dean arrive at Parsons, and he made me associate dean. And in that capacity, I worked with all of the departments. Um, all the academic, I mean, all the departments at Parsons, and continued to teach one course a week. And then, a long, 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 talk about flipping the pages of the calendar. There are not enough in this, they fill this room. And then we had a crisis of, in leadership in the fashion program, um, having to do with a department chair who was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. And we know that isn't ever good. So, we, she was stepping down, and we had to look for a new chair. And, and one of my roles as associate dean was to do chair searches for the dean. Um, and I, I also was very involved in curriculum development and worked with our affiliates abroad in the Dominican Republic and in Kanazawa, Japan, and in Seoul. Um, at, at one point in um, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, we're not there anymore. Um, and generally speaking, in my role as associate dean, I'm fond of saying I was a Mr. Fix-It. I was always sent in to fix things that were broken, otherwise known as I was a pooper scooper. <laughs> and in my days there, there was a lot of pooping happening at Parsons. <laughs> um, so we had this crisis of leadership. I was sent up to run the search, and we found out that, that there was just horrendously low morale in the fashion program. Why? Well, it turned, I mean, the, it was largely because the, stu the, the faculty were questioning what they were teaching and the students were questioning what they were learning, having to do with the fact that the program had barely changed in 50 years. And that was simply a matter of fact. Here we have an industry that is constantly changing or constantly changing now. But so we had a, a big dinosaur, we had an anachronism. And I will say that, that I wholeheartedly believe that the fashion design curriculum was relevant up until the late 80s. And that was exactly when the fashion industry here in America went into a, uh, a spiraling turmoil. And it, when it landed, when it started to, to congeal again and it landed finally, sort of like Dorothy's house in Oz, crushing a witch, um, it was a very different place. And the department hadn't responded to that, to how different the, the industry was. There was no technology in the department, for instance, or barely any. Um, there was an elective course that people told you not to take. Um, and it was just, I mean, a fabulous history, um, one that I still boast about, but, but, but not a great place, and it needed to be changed. So I was sent in for a year initially as acting chair. Mm -hmm. And I called the dean after I'd been there for three months, and I said, this place is hemorrhaging. So in terms of offering up a, 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 a diagnosis, I can give you the diagnosis right now about what it is, it's, and, and it is hemorrhaging. So we need to offer up and implement a curricular solution as soon as possible, meaning that next sep September. And normally, you'd phase in curriculum development for sophomore year, then junior year, then senior year, but because the place was hemorrhaging, we had to do it in one fell swoop. Now, and Kay, forgive me for this, but you're gonna, you know what happened. The jewel in the crown was a program called the Designer Critic Program. And my first year in the department, I couldn't really do anything other than observe. The budget had been set, the faculty had been hired, it was all done deal. So I did a ton of observing, sitting in classes, sitting in the critic sessions, and what I saw was a system of infantilization to beat the band. What do I mean by that? The faculty were infantilized by the administration, the administration or the, the students were infantilized by the faculty, and everybody was infantilized by the designer critics. So just as an example, Donna Karen, and Donna's actually a fabulous critic, but so therefore I can use her as an example. Donna would call, she had set up her own design challenge for the eight to 10 students she would work with over the course of the semester. She's already approved sketches um, and rearrange things among students' designs. We'll take the skirt from this and the top from that and the blouse from that. And um, So she was coming in to see muslins. This is the prototype of the garment. And she calls to say she's going to stay in Milan for another 10 days. 
and owing to her calendar, she can't be in for three weeks. Well, we're expecting you tomorrow. <laughs> so you'd like to think, well, we could move forward with this process. No, we can't. We cannot move in until we move on until Donna comes in and puts her hand on the muslin and says, yes, this can move forward. Can't happen. So everybody was in, was in suspension. The singers were wasting huge amounts of time. I mean, as I said about the program when I arrived, everyone's working hard, but nobody's working smart. Um, students were hand sewing the inside seams of garments. The inside seams, why? Because it's the way we've always done it. Well, the way we've always done it never sits well with me, ever. So <laughs> I met with the, the juniors who were rising to the senior year, because I looked at this designer critic thing and said, this guy has got to go. Not that the program isn't good. It, it needed to be repositioned in the junior year. Well, these, this group of students wouldn't benefit from that. So I met with them, and I asked them, how would you respond? Because if I don't get their buy-in, we can't do this. How would you respond if I were to tell you that the designer critic program, the jewel in the crown, the program that you came here for, I want to remove from your senior year experience? Well, there was dead silence in the room. There wasn't kicking and screaming. There was, there, was no, there was no noise at all. So then I asked, doesn't somebody want to know what you'd be doing instead? So I said, you will each design and execute a senior thesis, a collection, that, will, that you will present. Well, they went wild. They were cheering. They were, they were up on their feet. They were applauding. So I was thrilled by the reaction. But then I asked them, how many of you were terrified? And I had a couple of hands, a couple of very wise hands go up. <laughs> and I said, every hand in this room should be up because you've never faced a greater challenge. You're totally underprepared for what I'm presenting to you. You've been in a program that has been pre preparing you for this senior year capstone of further infantilization, of not thinking for yourselves, of only listening to others and following their directions. I don't care what you do with this thesis other than that you do it. But the direction that it takes has to be your point of view as a designer. You need to find out who you are. And it needs to be executed superbly. So that's all that I care about. Well, we move forward. We did it. Meanwhile, word in the industry isn't out until the invitations don't go out to the industry for, to be a designer critic. And that was 20 people. So they don't go out. I call and tell them what's happened. Well, you would have thought, I don't know what you would have thought. You would have thought I, I hi took, hi hijacked the entire nation. <laughs> they went wild with anger. And I was summoned to the dean's office, and fashion's up at 40th and 7th Avenue. So I ran down here, and there were four of the critics from the, former, from the earlier year all with the dean, all saying, that's the one. Get rid of that horrible man. And the dean at the time um, said, and I'm thinking, what? dean, why did you set me up this way? Why didn't you give me a little bit of a heads up? And he said, I wanted Tim with me so that Tim could hear me say to you, we're not bringing the program back. We're not doing it. We're moving forward in this way. I want you to know that I, Tim has all of my support, and I'm standing with him on this. So it was like, God bless you, Dean Swearer. <laughs> um, and they went away, but they didn't go away. So we had a jury show of the senior collections. And let me say something else. That, that class, the class of 2002, was a class of 70 students. In the former iteration of the program, that would have meant that at the end of the academic year, each student would have had two garments, one per semester per critic. So there'd be 140 garments. Suddenly, every student has anywhere from five to nine looks, not items, but looks. So suddenly, we have a ton of clothes that, we, that we're showing in this jury process. We have to do over three days. We do it on dress form, on mannequins. That was a whole other nightmare. At any rate, let me build up to what I want to say. We have to also, I'm sorry. because we have to uh, get some questions in there. Stan Herman, president of the Council of Fashion Designers of America, very powerful, incredibly powerful. He's now Diane von Furstenberg is the president, but Stan was at the time and had been for 14 years. Stan comes to the jury. He disappears into the auditorium. And he's in there for a long time. And I'm thinking, well, at least he didn't go running out, because he was the, one of the biggest naysayers. Stan comes out, and he looks at me, and he gestures over his shoulder towards the room. University of Cincinnati. What does that mean? 
University of Cincinnati. I'm a critic of the University of Cincinnati. This work is no better. And I would expect it to be great, because it always has been great. This is a symbol of your failure. And I think it's atrocious that you've done this to the students. All right, Stan, I need you to explain this to me. What do you mean? What, tell me about it. He said, look, the design's OK. But those textiles, they're horrible. They're homely. When I had my critic sessions, I used to see garbage like that. And I'd say, you're not using that. You're using this two-ply cashmere. I said, Stan, you're revealing what part of the problem was. These students have not been able to think on their own. What's revealed to me looking at this is that we need a huge textile education here that we haven't had. So to make a longer story, a little bit shorter, okay. we have the senior <laughs> show. Um, oh, I'll add, too. We have the senior show. It's the first time every senior hasn't shown. This is why we have the jury process. The jury process, though, we always put every student in, no matter how bad it was. The faculty would swoop in and fix it. But now we have a collection. So we did not have every student in. So suddenly, there, corresponding to the show, is a call for my resignation from the students. Suddenly, they're no longer happy and peppy and loving me. <laughs> they're hating me. Um, and the letter goes to the dean, at, at any rate. We have the show. And it's the first time in my whole history of Parsons when the show received a standing ovation at the end. The whole room, 1,500 people, they were all on their feet. They, and the following day is the first time that the press has ever written about the students' work. It's always about who was there, who was wearing home. It was never about the students. Suddenly, it was all about the students. And that evening, Stan Herman came up to me after wishing me ball shots before the show. He came up to me afterwards, threw his arms around me, and he said, never go back. I never dreamed they were this talented. I never dreamed they were capable of this. Of course, I did. I knew they were. And Julie Gilhart bought the Proenza Schooler collection right off the Parsons runway wow. that, that next day. That's so amazing. it was a phenomenal story. So that's how I got into fashion. It shows me. This is an amazing story. Sorry, guys. No, it was great. Really. You're amazing. I, so I want to open it up to some questions. If anyone has any questions it's for Tim. Don't be afraid to ask because <laughs> 40 minutes later, well, Susie will ask, does anyone ask another question? I don't think so. You can ask, you can ask anything. So you can stand up. So I have one right oh. here. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wanting to get, oh, sorry. Um, I'm Carrie Goldberg. I go to NYU, and I'm a communications major. Oh, great. Glad you're here. Um, I was just get, wanted to get your feedback about the last episode of Project One Runway, because you sure. turned from mentor to judge. Oh, and you've seen all of the Kenley fiasco yeah. and all of the fact that Coteau had added pieces to her collection, and I wanted to know how you translated that into your judgments. I'll tell you, I'll tell you about it. Thank you for asking, because it was, it was probably the most difficult Thanks. moment for me. I mean, the whole bracketed situation was the most difficult thing I've had to, to face on Project Runway. I was called by, by the producers on Thursday night, the night before a finale show. I was actually just leaving Christian Siriano's runway show and ready to head back to the workroom to meet with the final three and give them the order of show for the morning, look at their collections again, and inquire about the fittings because they were still going on. And I get, the call from the, I get this call from the, from the producer saying, Jennifer Lopez has backed out, and we want you to be the guest judge. And I said, no. I said, I can't do that. That's not my role. So again, <laughs> lo long story. I'll give you the practice. So end of call. Then Andy Cohen from Bravo calls me. Andy says, Tim, you're going to be the guest judge. No, I'm not. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I, I said, I have a relationship with them. It's one of trust. It's one of confidence. I said, I'm about to go into the workroom to, to, to meet with them again. I will be with them for a good three and a half to four hours tomorrow morning before the show. And if you're telling me I'm going to be the guest judge, I can't go back to the workroom tonight except to tell them that I'm going to be the guest judge. And I cannot be with them backstage tomorrow. It won't, that won't work because I said, as you know, I'm having a lot of difficulties with Kenley. <laughs> and to say anything to any of them that in any, case, in any way indicates that you might be in trouble here, then I could fulfill my own prophecy. And I said, I don't want to do that. So then he and the producers and I had a big conference call. And I said, OK, here's, here's what I want to say. 
because they were, st they were still looking for a, a, a guest judge. If you promise that you'll do due diligence finding a guest judge, I will go back to the workroom tonight, I'll meet with the designers at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning at Bryant Park, be with them all the way up to the point where we're ready to start the show. If you need me, then you will tell me mere moments before that show starts, because in my head, I have got to be with them doing the job that I need to do with them. Then it will be a big surprise. And that's exactly how we proceeded. And it was Heidi who came to get me, and she said, okay, this is really happening. And I'll tell you what I said to her. I, I, and I actually had the same massive anxiety attack. I'm having it right now, the same one I had then, just thinking about it. I said, I, Heidi, I don't think I can do it. I said, you and, you and Nina and Michael can just do it. We'll just have an empty seat, it's fine. She said, why? I said, I just gestured. I said, because of them. I, I just can't do this. And she said, are you telling me that in all of your years of teaching, this is Heidi talking, you couldn't, you, you couldn't separate your relationship with your students from the grade that you would give them? And I thought, she's right. <laughs> I can do this. But you know what was interesting for me as a judge? When, I'm, when I have my mentor role with the designers, I only see the work static. I see it on dress forms. Or I see it occasionally on a fit model, or on a, uh, one of our runway models, rather. But she's not moving very much because we're studying the garment. So for me, sitting there watching the show, it's the first time I saw the clothes walk. It's the first time I really saw them move. And it lent a whole new dimension of, of um, evaluation, of assessment for them. So it was, it was really great, because that was my point of departure with the designers when we went back to Parsons to have the, the question and answer session, and then eventually the, the deliberation. Does that help? Yeah. Good great. question. Should we go over there? We, oh. we alternating sides, okay. is that the idea? <laughs> Hi. 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 Um, my name is Natalie, Hi, and I Natalie. go to LIM. Good. I'm a merchandising major and an event planning minor. Great. And I wanted to know, um, in order to be successful in any aspect of the fashion industry, whether you want to be a writer or a designer or even a photographer, what are three important qualities that you would say are necessary to succeed? Well, first I would say you have to have an unconditional passion for what you do, because there are so many obstacles that will topple you, you've got to be able to come get right back up. Um, it, it's an extreme, these are extremely competitive fields. Um, the other is, and I know you probably won't, all probably won't believe that I'm about to say this, but I am, know how to listen and really listen. When people are talking to you, really listen to what they're saying. Um, they're giving you information, they're giving you feedback possibly, but they're giving you information that allows you to move forward in a certain way. I can't tell you with what frequency I meet people who just don't listen. And things have to be repeated three, four, five times sometimes. And, but you only know that when they get back to you and realize they didn't understand what you said to them. So listen, it's, it's, a, it's an important quality to have. And the other is, to navigate the world with just incredible respect for everyone with whom you meet and engage. Um, it's a very important quality, and I, I mean, I would say this to people in any field, whether you wanted to go into banking, but especially in this industry, um, you never know, I mean, there will be people who will irritate you, who will annoy you, who will make you angry. Take the high road. You never know who that per where that person will end up, who that, where, where they'll be. Um, I remember a, a, a student of mine, a senior, um, the, we had a very difficult situation, the two of us, at the end of the academic year, having to do with some very bad behavior on her part that was wholly inappropriate. And in, uh, regrettably, it was demonstrated publicly. It was not demonstrated privately. And she was very talented. She had a kind of tenacity that I... Um, that can work for you. It was working against her, regrettably. <coughs> but she really burned a bridge with me, big time. And we were having the season two Project Runway auditions, and the door opened, and there I was. <laughs> and I just abstained. I mean, so I can't participate in this. But you could tell on her face that she regretted 
doing that. And as Kenley did backstage when she saw that I was a judge, it was like, oh, I should have been nicer. Um, it was fine that she wasn't. But, but just, <laughs> just um, passion, listen, and conduct yourself with great respect for everyone with whom you work. Where's the microphone sure. going? Hi. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca, and I'm actually not a student. I'm just here as a huge fan of Project Runway you, and Rebecca. Guide to Style. Um, and I'm curious to know how you nominate yourself for Guide to Style. I'm sorry, I have a purely selfish question. I went on the website and well, tried to look and couldn't find it on anything. You did on the website? No. Oh, you have not or you have? I couldn't find it on the website. I have find not. It on the website? And beyond that, I guess if you just have any recommendations for like how somebody goes about getting a similar experience, since I know we can't all go on Guide to Style. But I would say then, then write to Bravo at 30 Rock, um, 30 Rockefeller Center. Write, write to them and, and declare yourself. Um, if it's for you, you look great, from the, at, least from, at least from the waist up. <laughs> um, similar experiences. I mean, I, I guess you could ha have a similar kind of experience with a personal shopper at a, at a department store. I would think that you could. I mean, I have to tell you also about Guide to Style and about my book. I Abrams Publishers actually came to me about writing a book. And they had a very particular need. They wanted, they wanted a book. I feel like I've been rude most of this time. <laughs> they wanted a book in the self-help category. They wanted a makeover book. And I looked at them and I said, makeover book? I don't do that. And they said, well, that's really what we want. So think about it and get back to us. So I knew I wanted to write a book. I was chair of Parsons, that fashion program. I thought it's the whole publisher parish thing. I mean, I don't know that they're thinking about that book. But at any rate, I did a lot of investigation and research. And I looked at the makeover books. And I have the greatest respect for them. But it's, I thought, this is not me. I'm not a fashion dictator. I'm not a fashion Spengali or ma magician. I'm much more of a fashion therapist. Um, it goes back to that Socratic approach that I described earlier. So. I went back to them and I said, OK, I can do this. But oh, well, actually, before I went back to them, I went to Diane von Furstenberg, who was my, my mentor. And I said, Diane, I have this opportunity. What should I do? And she said, well, take the opportunity, of course. And then I said, yeah, but, but you know what makeover books are like. I don't do that. She said, never lose your voice as an educator. She said, that's my advice to you. And, and, and I, th those words resonated me throughout the entire time that I was writing it. Um, so I went back to Abrams and I said, look, no photographs. I don't want people reading captions of photographs. I don't want that to be their experience with the book. Um, and I'm not going to offer up fashion prescriptions. Uh, it, it, it's, it's going to be really about helping people understand who they are and how they want to pre present themselves to the world. It's the semiotics of, of dressing. I mean, it closely we sent a message about how we want to be perceived. And, Therefore, that's why I say each one of us should accept responsibility for how we present ourselves to the world. Just accept responsibility for it. Dress however you want, but accept responsibility for it. As opposed to saying, I'm not a fashion person. No, OK, but you're a citizen of, of the world. How do you want to present yourself to the world? <laughs> because like it or not, and this is what people say, oh, you're, you're, that's so shallow of you. Like it or not, when somebody first en enters a room, the first thing I notice about them is their gender. And the second thing is what they're wearing. And based on what they're wearing, I make certain assumptions about them that could be wrong. I mean, if we have an opportunity to engage, I will we'll learn more about them. Mm -hmm. and, maybe, and, and we'll learn more about this particular way in which they're presenting themselves. Um, but if, a, if, if, the, if I notice the outfit before I'm noticing the person, that's a whole other kind of experience. And I'm not saying that even it's, that it's wrong. If the person presenting themselves as a float in a parade or a circus clown, I mean, this is the thing I'm speaking of, I'm sorry. Okay. When someone comes up in the street and says, what do you think about how I'm dressing? And they're dressed like a circus clown? Is this uh, what, what about the Socratic approach? Maybe they are a circus clown. You have to ask. They may be. So does that help? <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> My name is Eber, and I go to FIT. I'm Great. a fashion journalism major. I'm oh, focusing fashion on that. journalism? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I am asking your opinion, being on the business end of Liz Claiborne, what do you think the economical situation, I know magazines are focusing a lot on it as well right now, the economical situation, how it's influencing fashion. We saw it a lot in Fashion Week. And just your opinion, maybe strategies that Liz Claiborne is taking well, in terms of reaching out and rectifying the situation? 
Well, I mean, as everybody probably knows, when it comes to the world of retail, nobody's buying anything. Um, and people are scared. I mean, people's, many people don't have jobs or their incomes have been diminished in some way. Um, and people are very nervous about tomorrow and what the outcome will be. I, I mean, I have to say, I, I don't want to speak for Liz Claiborne because it's a publicly held company and that puts me in a bit of a sticky situation, but speaking as someone in the fashion industry, I, I'm not very optimistic about 2009. I think this is going to continue for a while. I don't know how you're feeling. Well, um, for Glamour Magazine, we're totally changing the strategy where we're talking oh, a lot Talk about, about this. well, we're talking a lot about how to kind of create a whole new wardrobe from your own closets or how to thrift, thrift shop or how to tailor things or how to just change one thing. And we're focusing on ways for you to get a look without spending a lot of money. Well, and so you're going to be seeing a lot of that going forward inside the pages of That's Glamour. great. And that corresponds to actually what we're doing on the road for Liz Claiborne. I'm, I'm now, we've just launched our holiday uh, fashion tour. Uh, which I, I do with a, a bunch of colleagues at Liz Claiborne who were fabulous. And we travel together and we do this. And that's why I was just in New Orleans. And the Liz Claiborne line is very affordable. It has fashion in it. But our holiday fashion show is really about education. It's how you can ha take one item and transition it three or four different ways about how you can use accessories to enhance the wardrobe that you already have um, and how you, can, how you can do this with a, and be very budget-minded and be successful at it. Um, and we're all, I mean, we're all looking for ways to still engage the consumer. I mean, I'm gonna be blunt. Do I want people to buy something? Yes, buy something. Do I want, expect you to spend a lot of money? No. Well, this is gonna be a great time for Liz Claiborne, too, because you know, so. the clothes are not so expensive and yeah. they're gorgeous. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Where are we going? Hi. Hi, my name is Allie. I'm also a fashion journalism major at FIT. Great. And I just wanted to ask you, Tim, you mentioned earlier how society seems to have this impression of the fashion industry as being all about glamour and cocktail parties and living the fabulous life. And, and I just can wanted I to add also ephemeral, like it's, it's not a very serious industry. Of course. Sorry, <laughs> to interrupt. I'll make it even worse. Um, and I just wanted to know do you think that the media and movies like um, the Double Wears Prada help to perpetuate this misconception about our industry, or do you think that the media portrays a realistic view of the fashion industry? Well, I think it's mixed, but I just have to say I think the Double Wears Prada is a fabulous movie. <laughs> and uh, having worked at Vogue, it has a lot of realism in it. <laughs> I mean, what I loved about it's talking about semiotics. What I love about that movie is it could you could remove all of the dialogue from it. Just watching Anne Hathaway's fashion transformation tells the whole story. Right. It's pretty extraordinary. Um, I, I mean, I think it's it is mixed. I mean, Project Runway couldn't have happened without Sex in the City. I mean, you, you, every, everything has predecessors, and and we're all, in a manner of speaking, kind of heir apparent. Um, and it depends upon which segment of the media you're talking about. You have, you have publications with incredible seriousness and integrity like Glamour, and then you have um, the tabloids that just want to tell you how awful people are dressing and, and how ridiculous they look. So it, it, really, it really does depend. I mean, do I want to um, follow the fashion of, of um, Jessica Simpson? No. <laughs> I'm not particularly interested, um, but do I want to learn uh, about um, why... Um, Sienna Miller looks so cute. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or, or, or why flourish and embellishment is um, more popular now than at, at, at other moments in this first decade of the century. Yeah, I think it's, I, I think it's very interesting. I mean, I will say fashion is a barometric gauge of our society and culture, like it or not. And when we look at uh, the whole history of mankind, what do we look at? The environments in which we lived and the, and the clothes that we wore. And because fashion, in a manner of speaking, is, a, is ephemeral, textiles don't last forever, at least um, non-wovens may last forever, but, but prior to, to um, the second half of the last century, that wasn't the case. But thank God for painting and sculpture, because that's how we know how people dressed. We certainly don't have clothes from the 1500s. Or not but many. fashion is fabulous and fun. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not having fun with it, you're taking it way too seriously. Hi, 
Hi. I'm Jan, and I teach psychology at Rutgers. How oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I study aging in my research, and I wonder if you could comment on the topic of aging, style, and fashion. You mean fashion for more mature people? Is that what you Oh, that's a terrible, perplexing problem. It really is. I mean, going back to Liz Claiborne, what I love about our holiday fashion shows is that we use models that range from 6 to 16. Um, I'm talking about sizes, not ages. Um, <laughs> and we have women who are from their mid-20s to their, well, to 60. And we're, so we're putting clothes that I consider to be fashion on women who are real women not these um, pre-adolescents who are walking around Bryant Park. Um, it is a pervasive problem, and I'm the first to admit it. I'm not going to say, oh, well, if you go to such and such and so and so and wherever, you'll, you'll see that ad address better. Um, it's simply extremely difficult and challenging to design for more mature women um, without making them dowdy or it, without making them inappropriately um, hoochie. Um, <laughs> and that's why it's just, it's, it's extremely difficult. Does it need to be addressed? Yes. And I'm the one, I mean, not the one voice, but I'm the voice at our company across the brands. And we have Juicy Couture, and we have Lucky Jeans, and DKNY Jeans, and Kate Spade, um, among others. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the voice one of the voices of the company that is constantly talking about this. We, we need to do this. And part of the conundrum also sits with the retailers. I mean, the Liz Claiborne brand is a wholesale brand. We don't have freestanding stores. So the, the, the retailers come to the showroom and, and buy what they buy. And they also have to get their heads around the importance of this population. It's one of the things I love about our fashion tours is because we have oh, anywhere from six to eight hundred women come to these. And they're a voice, and they're, they're, they're tenacious in their own way, and they want to tell us what we're not getting right. And the retailers are there as our partners to listen to this. Uh, because in fact, we have design that does address more mature women, I think, in a very beautiful, um, proud way. And then the stores don't buy it, so the, the customer doesn't experience it. Mm -hmm. uh, this was. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you by way of yet another anecdote. Um, my big learning curve when I came to the company, I, first thing I did was I toured all the showrooms. And I had heard all this doom and gloom about Liz Claiborne apparel about, oh, it's so dowdy, it's so terrible, it's so, oh. Well, I went to the showroom and I thought, no, it's not. This looks good. Um, admittedly, there are the t-shirts and the, and the just plain old pants. Um, but there was a lot of really beautiful fashion in the showroom. So then I'm in an airport, luggage carousel, a woman comes up to me and says, oh, I heard you joined Liz Claiborne. I'm so glad that brand needs you. Well, I explain I'm not designing, but I'm working with the designers, whatever. But then I say, but you need to visit your store because it's so much better. Where do you see it? It's really good. So then I visit her store and realize the store bought the T-shirts and the dumb pants. Right. So for the customer, they're not experiencing the fashion. So it's a big, it's a big collaborative partnership here. We have to all get on board together. And, and, and help with the retailers as well. But it is certainly a conundrum. Do you think Isaac Mizrahi will affect that in any Isaac, way? Isaac, I've seen the spring line. Um, it's fabulous. We'll see what the stores have bought. That I don't know. Hmm. So, but, and that's, that could be a whole other seminar right. about the whole Liz Claiborne situation. Right. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, Kelly Thomas. I'm a buyer from Neiman Marcus. Hi, Kelly. Hello. We love Neiman Marcus. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> we hope everyone does. Um, in light of the election that's happening tomorrow, what are your thoughts on the part that fashion has played in the selection so far, as far as the differing styles of the potential first ladies and the drama surrounding the VP candidate? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Our stance is no comment. <laughs> Well, you can go to Newsweek.com and hear me on the topic. Um, 
I mean, as Conan O'Brien said to me, well, I guess you're not biased. I mean, I'm a huge Obama fan, and Michelle Obama is, I mean, she will, she will bring style and grace back to Washington. She really will. Let's hope she does. And on the other topic, um, I don't even know how to respond. It's, if, if this were a movie, we'd fire the script writers. <laughs> We would. It's just too, the whole thing is too, simply too preposterous. It just is. Um, and is there a more unhappier looking first lady prospectus, whatever the word would be, than Cindy McCain? I mean, <laughs> she looks like somebody has a, has a, 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 I don't know, a bayonet in her back. It's like, <laughs> keep going, keep going, try to smile, try to smile. And, and, and talk about the semiology of clothes. Look at Michelle Obama. Those relaxed sheets, they fit her beautifully. Gorgeous color, resonates a confidence. And then you look at Cindy McCain wearing a fashion version of a straitjacket. It's all said and done. And the other one, well. For one more question, and I know there's somebody here. I'm going to let the student. Hi. Hi. My name is Danielle. Um, I'm a student at FIT. I'm an advertising major, and I'm a really big fan of Project you, Runway. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I just want to know if you could tell us anything about season six, because I know you said you just wrapped that season. I don't know if you're allowed to speak about it. Well, I can it, tell you things in broad strokes. Um, we, we taped in Los Angeles, and there was, I mean, there still is talk, like, what does Los Angeles have to offer? And I have to say, I was one of those people too, but I thought, I have, I'm, I'm part of the show, I need, to, I need to support it. But I went, I mean, I went kicking and screaming for a number of reasons. One, we were in Los Angeles. The other, I was gonna be sleeping in my bed for six weeks, so I, I, that whole little degree of upset. Plus, the, the schedule was suddenly thrust upon us, and I had to change all these things at Liz Claiborne, and it was just, it was a bit of a mess. But then when we were there, we really embraced the city, which I, was, I, I became thrilled by and inspired by. There's so much that it has to offer, and I was reminded in my, with my fashion historian hat on, America didn't ascend to become a, pl a place that anyone even thought of for fashion fashion, things we wear day in and day out, until after w World War II, really, when, when the couture houses closed in Paris. Suddenly there was this void, America stepped in, and we stopped copying what was happening in Europe, and we started um, creating our own. We had Claire McArdle, we had Norman Norell, we, I mean, the list could go on. But prior to that, that first half of the 20th century, where did the early graduates of Parsons go? We had the first fashion program in the nation, began in, in 1906, they went to Hollywood. They were all part of, of what was to become a burgeoning film industry that would really inspire people the, the film goers about how they wanted to dress. In fact, one of the most famous, Gilbert Adrian, Parsons graduate, who headed the MGM uh, costume department for more than 30 years, he had a ready-to-wear line because people wanted, people wanted to go to a store and buy a version of what he had designed for Greta Garbo or Joan Crawford or Norma Shearer. So I was reminded of how critically important Hollywood was, Los Angeles was, to the whole fashion industry in that first half of the, of the 20th century. It continues to be important, largely because of, of um, costume, but also because of red carpet. Also, it's, it's one of the centers of denim. Um, but it's, it's a really, it's, it's a vibrant fashion uh, city, and, and, I, and I learned a lot about it. So that's what I can tell you about it. <laughs> Plus, we have incredible, incredible designers and a great round of judges. I just hope everyone will get to see it. We'll end it. It's just been so wonderful. Been we love you. Thanks, thanks. I want to thank all of you. <laughs> and thank you, Susie. Great job. Thank you.